In this video, we'll derive the equations of motion for the airfoil shown in the diagram. This airfoil has two degrees of freedom. Uh, the first is something we'll call the plunge, also known as the heaving degree of freedom, and historically is called H, and is defined as positive downwards. I tend to also call this flapping, and I think the heaving comes from analysis of ships, actually. But uh, in aircraft, mostly they call it plunge, and then the angle of attack, which is the angle alpha, the angle of rotation of the airfoil. Okay, the airfoil is attached to a rigid surface by a spring of constant k, a linear spring, and then a torsional spring of constant k sub t. In addition, I've gone ahead and written the parallel axis theorem. Uh, M is the mass of the airfoil, and J sub CG is the rotatory inertia of the airfoil about its center of gravity. And then finally, I've written Lagrange's equations. So the idea is, is we have to find the kinetic and potential energy of the system, and then substitute that into Lagrange's equations to get the equations of motion. So first of all, we'll look at the potential energy of the system. That's very simple to write. It's just equal to 1 half times k times h squared plus 1 half the torsional spring k sub t times alpha squared. We'll call that equation 2. Okay, the kinetic energy is slightly more involved. It's equal to 1 half times the mass times the velocity of this mass. Now, the mass is moving downwards as a result of h, h dot, but also as a result of the rotation alpha, it's moving upwards. Okay, so how do we do that? We say that it's equal to h dot minus e sub alpha, I mean e times alpha, I should say, dot. So that's a half mv squared of the mass, Plus, there's rotatory in, uh, kinetic energy due to the, the J, the rotatory inertia. And the way we write that is it's one-half times J. Now, which J are we going to use? Is it J above is about zero or J about the center of gravity? The answer is it's about the center of gravity. J times the center of gravity. J of the center of gravity, I should say, times alpha dot squared. Okay, multiplying this out, we get one half times m h dot squared minus the two cancels the half uh, e m h dot times alpha dot. plus one-half m e squared alpha dot squared. In fact, let's write it like this. Just erase that. I'll write it as, well, e squared m plus j c g times alpha dot squared. And then we can simplify it a little bit more. One half m h dot squared minus e m h dot alpha dot plus one half. And then using the parallel axis theorem, this is just j zero, j of uh, j sub zero alpha dot squared. Okay, and we'll call that equation three. Now we know that the Lagrangian L is just equal to T minus V. We'll call that equation 4. And then finally, we want to substitute equations 2, 3, and 4 into Lagrange's equations, which is 1. So let me write that out. 2, 3, and 4 into equation 1. And the first equation, we use the generalized coordinate as H. And we find that that is m h double dot 
taking the derivative of this with respect to h dot and then with respect to time gives me the double dot minus e m the h dot cancels and I'm left with alpha dot time derivative gives me a double dot and then that's it for the contribution of the kinetic energy and I've got to add to that from the potential energy k h is equal to, since there are no applied forces in this case, to zero. Call that equation five. And then the alpha equation of motion <clears throat> is um, minus, you're going to start off with this term, since this term here doesn't have an alpha dot in it. This would be EMH double dot. And then the contribution of this term is just J naught alpha double dot. All right. Make some space. We'll rewrite this in matrix form. Matrix and that looks like um, M minus EM minus EM J0 this is times H double dot alpha double dot plus k zero zero k sub t this is h and alpha I'll call this equation seven and that's it um, the interesting thing about this problem however I'm just going to add this in here is <clears throat> Generally, the forcing function on the right wouldn't be zero, and this is zero vector, by the way. Just have to do that in blue. It's zero and zero, that's why. Um, generally, the forcing function would be something like uh, you'd have a lift. I'm just going to put it acting here through the center of gravity. <clears throat> by the way, in most airfoils, the center of gravity is actually aft of the, elas the elastic axis. And the only difference is, is that these values here would be positive, if that were the case, if the CG were actually aft of the elastic axis. Okay, but in general, what you'd have is you'd have lift here, and then <clears throat> obviously the lift would be um, a negative force, so it's actually negative lift. The moment, the lift would be creating a positive moment, in other words, a pitch-up moment, L times E. And in that case, that's what would go on the side of the equation. And the interesting thing, obviously, is that L is actually a function of alpha, actually a function of alpha dot 2, H dot, if you're looking at total unsteady lift or aerodynamics. And what would be interesting then is you actually have a function on this side of the equation, on the right-hand side, that is a function of your uh, degrees of freedom. So you would have to move those to the left. They would contribute to your mass, stiffness, and damping matrices. I'm going to delete this just to clear it up a bit, but um, I just wanted to make mention of that, that this problem actually becomes quite a lot more interesting the minute you have a forcing function, in the case of aerodynamic forces, that is dependent on your degrees of freedom. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say in this video. I hope you found something useful. If you have, feel free to leave me a comment. Please give it a thumbs up so that others can get to watch this too. Thanks for watching and we'll catch up with you in the next video.